Well, hello again and welcome to another episode in this new series looking at the coastline of Durham and Tyne and Weir. Today we are just south and actually just around the corner from our last location at Whitley Bay, here in a place called Colourcoats. The name Colourcoats comes from two Anglo-Saxon words, culver meaning a dove and coat uh, meaning a shelter. Combined meaning dove's shelter. Now, before you all start running away with the idea that this place sprang up because there was once a dovecot here, or the Geordies uh, would know it as a pigeon tree, um, stop because it's got nothing to do with that at all. Though I have to admit, in my research, I read a few accounts. Um, that were seeking to find a connection with the village and a dovecot. But I can tell you there is no connection to be found and sadly they are barking up the wrong tree. The answer is much simpler. Remember at our last location we learned that one of the prominent families living here um, or in the Whitley area were called Dove. Well, the place name comes from that family. So colour coats means the Dove family's shelter or home. Colour coats was founded in 1539, but it wasn't until 1600 that it appeared in the first records and back then it was called Culver Coats. It was originally part of Tynemouth, separated from Whitley by Marden Burn. In fact Marden means Boundary Dean and of course a Dean is a wooded valley. The original settlement here was Marden, just a short distance inland from here. The coastal settlement we see today grew during the Victorian era in their ever relentless search for places to bathe and relax. Coal was mined in this area from 1315 in Bell Pits, but the mines were destroyed during a Scottish raid. The name Bell Pit comes from the shape of the excavation. They were usually dug where the coal or whatever ore they were mining was close to the surface. A vertical narrow shaft was dug down to reach the coal or ore and then the miners would dig outward from the base of the shaft in 360 degrees forming a bell-like chamber. Supporting the roof to prevent collapse was not practiced, so once the roof became unsafe the pit was abandoned and another pit was dug nearby. The coal was used for the heating of the salt pans in salt production, as we discussed before, and there were 19 salt pans here at Culvercoats. The land all around here belonged to the Delaville family until 1618, when it was sold to a Thomas Wrangham but then it was sold on to Thomas Dove of Whitley. The Dove family had become Quakers, which didn't bear well with the Priory at Tynemouth. Although the Priory itself was dismantled in 1539, 
ordered by Henry VIII and no longer a Catholic stronghold, the church in the priory grounds remained along with the prior's house. The Quaker belief had its roots in Protestant Christianity, but anything other than the Tudor view of that time was regarded as heresy. Thomas Dove's two eldest sons, John and William, were imprisoned in Tynemouth Castle for attending a Quaker meeting. Robert, the youngest son, was not Quaker and furthered the family's business interests in coal and salt, building himself a house at Colourcoats in 1668. Throughout the 1500s and most of the 1600s, a political feud had raged between the ports of Newcastle, North Shields and South Shields over salt production and where it could be exported from. Without going into the whys and wherefores, suffice it to say that building a harbour in colour coats away from those ports was a major benefit. In 1676, Thomas Dove went into partnership with Henry Hudson of Newburn and together they invested in developing coal mines at Whitley and Colourcoats. In 1677 work began on building a wooden pier for the export of coal and a wagonway was built to transport the coal from Marden down to the pier. In 1682, John Dove's son, also called Thomas, who had helped develop the new port at Colourcoats, built himself a house on the promontory where I'm standing now, called Sparrow Hall, also called Dove Hall by the local people. A portion of it um, has been preserved today by the side of the main coast road through the town and it's literally just a few yards away from where I'm standing. Eventually the Dove family sold their estate to a rather colourful character called Zephaniah Haddock and he was a devout Quaker and perhaps a Quaker preacher. It appears that most of Colourcoats was Quaker at this time and although it was viewed as undesirable uh, as, a, as a practice, um, nevertheless it was tolerated. The coal and salt industries at Colourcoats were relatively short-lived. A storm in 1710 demolished the pier, making export difficult. The mines both at Colourcoats and Whitley were fully worked out by 1723 and 1724. Without the coal, the salt industry couldn't survive either, and that was transferred to Blythe. The last shipment of salt from Colourcoats was aboard the ship Fortune of Whitby, and that took place in 1726. Colourcoats reinvented itself as a fishing port and soon became renowned for its herring catchers. The unsuccessful Jacobite uprising of 1715 had made the authorities suspicious of Papists and Quakers. So because of Colourcoat being predominantly Quaker, it became the focus of attention. 
The authorities, having become nervous of Quakers and Papists, focused their attention on the Quaker leader, Zephaniah Haddock. For some reason, he appeared in the court at Morpeth and he was indicted for failing to swear on the Holy Bible in front of a judge. Eleanor, the only surviving daughter of John Dove and the heiress to the Dove estate, married the Reverend Kerwin Huddleston in 1742 and the Dove family ceased at colour coats, or at least the name ceased. By 1749, it was written that colour coats had the best fish market in the north of England. The Georgian era saw the beginnings of colour coats being recognised for its sea bathing and summer vacations by the rich and famous. Saltwater baths were built in the early 1800s so that the gentry and fashionable ladies could bathe in private without having to brave the seashore. The pier was rebuilt in 1848 which provided safe moorings for the fishing fleet. However, in that same year a Kobel fishing boat um, happened to be taking a pilot out to a ship moored further out at sea. Rough seas caused it to capsize with all in the boat lost. That prompted the Duke of Northumberland to fund and install a lifeboat at Cullercoats. If you watched the last series I did on the coast of Northumberland, you will remember that the Sailor Duke, as he became known from his naval career, Algernon Percy IV Duke, had a great interest in the safety of sailors. He provided funds for many lifeboats along the Northumberland coast, the following year, in 1849, the new lifeboat capsized, trying to launch in a storm, drowning all 20 people on board. It was this disaster that prompted the Duke to arrange a competition to design a new, safer type of lifeboat. If you recall, he offered 100 guineas for the best design, which was won by James Beeching with his self-writing boat. The Duke paid for an initial three boats. One was installed here at Cullercoats and the other two at Newbiggin and Hawksley. The lifeboat placed here at Cullercoat was called the Percy, after the Duke, and it was normally pulled down to the water's edge by plough horses, the same as it was at Hawksley. During this period, the village was best known for its womenfolk, called the Herring Lasses. Not only were they hard-working, collecting the worms for baiting the fishing lines, helping to sort the catch, as well as carrying the very heavy fish creels around the streets selling the fish, but they were brave too. On New Year's Day 1861, a ship called the Lovely Nelly from Siam was driven onto the rocks during a blizzard at Briardine, just north of Whitley. The storm was so fierce, it was going to be a 50-50 chance that the lifeboat would have been able to launch from Colourcoats Bay. 
The horses that normally pulled the lifeboat down to the water were not available that particular uh, day. And so it was the women who dragged the lifeboat over the headland and um, managed to launch it from Whitley Beach. That was very similar to the story we heard in the last series at Newbiggin, and it in fact happened several times um, as we heard in the North Yorkshire series, um, all up and down the northeast coast. It was just something that the women did in that day. All the crew were saved apart from Tommy the cabin boy, who was too scared to jump into the lifeboat. Sadly, his body was washed ashore the following day. In 1865, the Colour Coat Life Brigade was formed, consisting of 60 to 70 fishermen. Their job was to assist the Coast Guard in saving lives from the shore using the rocket equipment, which I described in the Cresswell episode of the last series. It required a 24-hour watch being kept whenever there was a rough sea or storm. The fishermen on the watch rotor literally had to stand behind a low wall overlooking the harbour for shelter. The rescue equipment was stored in the brigade house today used as a garage and car repair business. In 1877, the Board of Trade decided to build a watchtower and plans were drawn up by the Newcastle architect, Frank Rich. It was built on the very same spot that the watch had always used, overlooking the harbour, and Browns Point Headland. It was opened in 1879. Around the same time, the Corporation of Tynemouth decided to extend John Street to meet with Whitley Lane, which meant that the Quaker burial ground would need to be moved. The necessary permissions were obtained and the bodies and headstones were moved to Preston Cemetery in North Shields. Jumping back a decade to 1864 saw the installation of a railway station to serve the new Blythe and Tyne Railway. In 1882, the Blythe and Tyne Railway became part of the much larger Northeastern Railway and the line and a new station was built nearer to the coast. That station is still used today by the Tyne and Weir Metro Light Railway. With the coming of the railways, like most of the northeast coast, came the Victorian industrialists, seeking summers away from the grime of the cities. At Colourcourt came a band of Victorian artists, known as the Colourcourt Colony. The artist at the head of this group was an American landscape painter called uh, Winslow Homer famous for his marine landscapes. He lived in room 17 of the Huddleston Arms, later became the Bay Hotel, for a whole year between 1881 and 1882. He rented a small studio across the road at number 12 Bank Top, 
and that was demolished in 1930. The Bay Horse is no longer there either. Today an apartment block stands on the site called Winslow Court after the artist. Henry Emerson, Robert Jobling and Ralph Headley were just some of the other prominent artists in the group. In 1897, a marine laboratory was set up by the Armstrong College, a faculty of the Durham University, for the study of the sea on the northeast coast. The original building was not much more than a large wooden hut, which unfortunately caught fire in 1904 and destroyed the laboratory and the saltwater baths which were adjacent. In September of 1908 a new marine laboratory opened um, pretty much as you see it today. The building was financed by William Huddleston who named it after his ancestor Eleanor Dove. The laboratory carries out marine research for Newcastle University today. It opens to the public occasionally during certain specific events in the summer. One of the original rows of fishermen's cottages still exists in Simpson Street which is just behind the main street. Today they are all freshly painted like the TV series Tobermory. On the south headland known as Saddle Rocks is a smuggler's cave and on Cullercoat's most southern boundary sits St George's Church. It was designed by John Loughborough Pearson and built with funds from the 6th Duke of Northumberland, another Algernon Percy, in 1884. The church is in a French Gothic style and a listed building. Both the fishermen in colour coats and shipping approaching Tynemouth used the church spire as a navigational aid. Just before I go, um, I just wanted to add that um, the village of Cullercoats is mentioned in the lyrics of the Dire Straits hit Tunnel of Love from their 1980 album making movies. Well that's all from here in Colour Coats so I'm going to leave you to watch my movie or my aerial movie of Colour Coats Village and while you're all watching that I shall venture a little bit further south to our next location so I'll see you over there very soon.
Well, hello once more. We are now at the southern edge of North Tyneside at the mouth of the River Tyne in the very affluent town of Tynemouth. The focus and history here at Tynemouth centres around the headland where evidence of settlements go back to at least the Iron Age and maybe before that. Any position at the mouth of a river is going to command importance in controlling traffic at the river mouth and the River Tyne is a very significant river strategically. The rocks that form the headland here are magnesian limestone, sandy yellow in colour. These rocks stretch all the way south to Hartlepool before dipping below the earth's surface. We will see them again several times on our journey south. The outcrop of rock on this north side of the river was occupied during the Iron Ages by the Celtic Votadini tribe. The Votadini people were an Iron Age tribe occupying southeastern Scotland and most of Northumbria. They were fierce people, highly organised and accomplished metal workers producing weapons from iron and bronze. They were particularly recognised for their decorative painted bodies, similar to other Celtic tribes of that time. They built hill forts in strategic places, easy to defend and provided centres for trade as well as defence. The Votadini traded openly with other tribes and also the Romans when they arrived here in the northeast around 80 AD. After the Romans left Britain, the Votadini territory north of the Tweed became known as the Kingdom of Gododin and the area between the Tweed and the Tyne called Brynach. When the Angles, Jutes and Saxons arrived around 547 AD, they established Bernicea. Some of the Votadini integrated into the new kingdom, but most chose to retreat north into Scotland. They continued to fight with the Anglo-Saxons until the 13th century forming some of the legions that invaded England regularly throughout the 12th and 13th centuries. They named this settlement on the headland as Penbal Crag. The name is an interesting one to examine and can be split into three parts. Pen or Ben means a hill or head as in Ben Nevis, for example. Pen is a prefix in words such as Penzance or the Pennines or Penshaw Monument, which is just west of Sunderland. Bal is an old Irish Celtic word for place of strength. Crag is an English derivative from the Scottish Celtic Criag or the Welsh Celtic Careg and means rock. Altogether then, Penbal Crag means a strong rock headland. This was altered to Benabal Crag by the Anglo-Saxons after the Romans left these shores, but the meaning is the same. An archaeological dig in 1963 found the remains of a roundhouse 11 and a half metres in diameter. 
Defensive ditches were found around it, suggesting that this was a fortified settlement. Roman pottery was found also. Just a few miles inland from here is the Roman fort of Sedudunum, which marked the eastern end of Hadrian's Wall. On the south side of the river mouth was the fort of Arbea, today known as South Shields, and that guarded the mouth of the river from the south. It is more than likely the Romans would also have put a signal tower on this north side as well. If you watch the film I made with Anna Gray on Hadrian's Wall, it mentions that Hadrian had originally thought of extending the wall to the coast at Tynemouth, but decided against it. During some work being carried out on the castle in 1782, Roman Mithraic altar stones were found. That doesn't necessarily mean that a Mithraic temple was here. The Anglo-Saxons would carry cut stone many miles as it was seen as so valuable. It is likely the altar stones were carried from the fort at Sedgudunum in the post-Roman era. If you want to learn more about the Roman Mithraic temples, then please watch the Hadrian's Wall film. Referring back to my last series on Northumberland, you will recall that the first self-appointed king of Bernicia was Ida. It was his grandson, Ethelfrith, that married Acca of Deira, forming the Kingdom of Northumbria, of which Tynemouth was a large part. When Ethelfrith was murdered by Redwald of East Anglia, it was Acca's brother Edwin that was made King of Northumbria. Acca's son and Edwin's nephew Oswald was heralded as England's first Christian king, but actually Edwin was a Catholic Christian too. The difference was that Edwin did little to advance Christian belief during his reign, unlike Oswald. However, it was Rosella, Edwin's daughter, who became a nun here in Tynemouth in a small wooden church called St Mary's, which was positioned on the headland. In 632 AD, Edwin was killed in battle and as we know, Oswald became King of Northumbria. It was Oswald that built the first monastery on the headland in stone, replacing the wooden church of St Mary. It is thought that three kings were buried in the grounds of the monastery. King Oswin, King Osred and King Malcolm III of Scotland, making the priory a place of pilgrimage. After King Oswald's death at the Battle of Maserfield in 642 AD, Oswin was made King of Deira and the Kingdom of Northumbria was split into its former parts of Bernicia and Deira. Oswy, the younger brother of Oswald, took charge of Bernicia. After seven years of peaceful coexistence, Oswy, greedy for more land, had Oswin killed. His body was brought to Tynemouth for burial. King Osred II was a distant ancestor of the original Bernician King Ida. 
Osred only ruled for one year before being exiled to the Isle of Man. On his return from exile, he was killed by King Ethelred, the man who had deposed him. Osred's body was taken to Townmouth for burial. The third king was a Scottish king, Malcolm III. Malcolm had sought to expand Scotland south to the River Tees and take most of Cumbria. William Rufus, the son of William the Conqueror, refused to negotiate and on Malcolm's second raid into Northern England, he was killed in the Second Battle of Annick in 1093. He was the final king to be buried at Tynemouth. The North Tyneside coat of arms bears three crowns in recognition of these kings. In the years preceding 800 AD, there had been several raids on the Northumbrian coast by the Danes. The most revered was the attack on Lindisfarne in 793 AD. Tynemouth witnessed its first Viking raid seven years later in 800 AD, destroying the priory. In 851 AD, the Danes returned, this time with the intention of staying, and set up a settlement near York. In 867 AD, the Danes captured York. Northumbria at this time had no strong leadership, and so the Danes saw their opportunity for a full-scale invasion. They came in huge numbers in 875 AD, sailing into the time, destroying everything in their path, including the priory here, which was burned to the ground. However, they spared the Church of St Mary. The headland here at Tynemouth, along with those at Whitby and Scarborough, became Danish strongholds for the next 200 years, until they were expelled by the Normans when they invaded. Northumbria then became a series of regions ruled by earls. One such deposed earl, Tostig Goodwinson, um, used Tynemouth as his base. He was the brother of the famous King Harold. Tostig was opposed to King Edward's policies, the king of that time, while his brother Harold was the king's confidant. In 1064, after several disagreements and skirmishes, Harold suggested that his brother be banished to France rather than be executed. Shortly afterwards, King Edward slipped into a fatal coma without declaring a successor. Harold assumed his throne and became king. Tostig was furious and planned to depose his brother. Tostig allied with the Norwegian king Hardrada, sailed across the North Sea and into Tynemouth with their combined armies. After resting and taking on supplies, they sailed south into Yorkshire via the Humber River. They were both killed by Harold's army at the Battle of Stamford Bridge near York in September 1066. Of course, only one month later, Harold would be killed at the Battle of Hastings by the invading Normans and William the Conqueror. Around 1072, saw the start of the restoration of the priory here. 
Because of its history and acclaim with kings and saints, it became the centre of pilgrimage with wealthy visitors, bequeathing gifts and lands. Within 100 years, Tynemouth Priory owned lands from the Tyne right up to the River Tweed. At some point during this period, there was a castle defence built around the Priory, which it is thought consisted of earthworks with a wooden stockade inside. When William the Conqueror died in 1087, his throne in England was taken by his third son, William Rufus, and his lands in France were taken by his eldest son, Robert Curtos. The two brothers were bitter rivals. Robert de Mowbray had been made the Earl of Northumberland in 1086, and he occupied Bamborough Castle as his base. He owned most of Northumbria from the Scottish borders right down to the southern boundary of North Yorkshire. When William Rufus forced Mowbray to uh, relinquish uh, a lot of his lands in Durham and North Yorkshire, Mowbray decided to um, take the side of Robert, his brother, and along with the barons of the north, he planned to remove William from the throne. The rebellion in 1095 failed and the barons abandoned Mowbray, letting him take the blame. He barricaded himself into Bamborough Castle, where William's army laid siege to the castle. Mowbray escaped and fled to Tynemouth. William's army followed Mowbray south and besieged the castle at Tynemouth for six days. Mowbray was caught and imprisoned for life at Windsor Castle in London. His lands were confiscated by the Crown. After William Wallace's raid into Northumberland in 1296, Tynemouth was granted permission to surround the Priory with walls of stone. Following further raids by Robert the Bruce in 1314, a gatehouse and barbican were added at the landward side of the Priory. In the following 200 years plus, Tynemouth and its Priory flourished until Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. Although the Priory was dismantled, the fortified walls around it and the gatehouse were strengthened to meet the potential threat of attack from either the Spanish, the French or the Scottish. During the English Civil War of 1642, Tynemouth Castle was occupied by the Scottish, sympathetic to the parliamentarians. The defeated King Charles I was held by the Scots in Newcastle. A Dutch ship arrived at Tynemouth on Christmas night in 1646 on a secret mission to rescue the king. The attempt failed and the king was handed over to the parliamentary commissioners. The civil war was the last military engagement seen at the castle. It was garrisoned in 1650 as a precaution during the war with the Dutch over trading rights though it didn't see any action. It was also garrisoned during both Jacobite rebellions and the Napoleonic Wars, just as a precaution 
such is its strategic importance. The town during this entire time was no more than a row of dwellings that formed a short street. Front Street, as it's known today, developed during the Georgian era from the mid-1700s. The Victorians began building spacious seaside homes here in typical Victorian terraced rows. Front Street today is a collection of upmarket restaurants, antique and craft shops and cafes. A famous fish and chip shop was a favourite of the legendary guitarist Jimi Hendrix. Just opposite the entrance to the castle is a gothic clock tower and drinking fountain. Water was provided to homes in the 1800s, but only for the rich. Money was provided in 1861 by William Scott for the provision of a drinking fountain for the poor. It was designed by Oliver and Lamb architects in a Venetian Gothic style with aspects of Byzantine and Islamic influences to reflect Tynemouth's past as a major trading port. It also reflects Tynemouth's wealth and importance. The War Memorial is also rather grand, which was originally erected for Queen Victoria in 1902. The King's Priory School, named after the three kings, Oswin, Osred and Malcolm, buried in Tynemouth, has had a host of famous students, including Stan Laurel, Ridley Scott and racing driver Jason Plato. The Grand Hotel, just a short distance along the seafront, was also a favourite haunt of Stan Laurel. He stayed there frequently when he visited the northeast. The annex to the hotel is named Laurel House after him. The hotel was originally built as the seaside retreat of the Duchess of Northumberland. Other famous visitors to Tynemouth have been Lewis Carroll, Charles Dickens, Thomas Buick, and Giuseppe Garibaldi, the man the biscuit was named after. Garibaldi stayed in Tynemouth when he came to Britain to discuss the unification of Italy in 1854. Beneath the headland, castle and priory at the actual mouth of the Tyne is the Collingwood Monument. Admiral Lord Cuthbert Collingwood was born in Newcastle and first went to sea at the age of 12. Rising through the ranks of the Navy, he is best remembered for his part in the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, where he took charge of the battle following Nelson's death. Collingwood's monument at Tynemouth dates from 1847 and was designed by the Newcastle architect John Dobson, though the statue of Collingwood himself is by John Graham Lough. The monument and its pedestal with the steps leading up to it is 23 metres high. Cannons at the base of the monument are from Collingwood's ship, the Royal Sovereign. Nearby, beneath the rock of the castle, is a tiny cove and beach that is the home to Tynemouth Sailing Club. Here, projecting into the sea, is the 900 yard long North Pier or Breakwater. It took 40 years to build between 1854 and 1895, 
built by Newcastle's Trinity House and the lighthouse at its terminus was built between 1903 and 1908. An earlier lighthouse had once stood within the grounds of Tynemouth Priory but was demolished in the 1890s. There have been five separate stations at Tynemouth dating back to 1847, three specialising in freight only. The current station at Tynemouth was opened by the North Eastern Railway in 1882 with the station designed by architect William Bell. It served throughout the Victorian period bringing thousands of day trippers and holiday makers to Tynemouth from industrial Tyneside. In August 1980 it was incorporated into the Tyne and Weir Metro Light Rail System. The station needed refurbishment in 2012 and nowadays hosts a very popular weekend market selling antiques, crafts, food and books. There are three beaches at Tynemouth a small cove known as Priors Cove on the south side of the headland. On the north side of the Priory is King Edward's Bay, a reference to Edward II who hid in the castle running from a Scottish defeat at Bannockburn in 1314. The beach to the north is Long Sands Beach, which runs all the way north to Colour Coats. An open air swimming pool was opened on the beach in 1925 and considered a major attraction in its heyday. In recent years, it has fallen into disrepair. However, there are plans to restore it to its former glory. At the north end of Long Sands Beach is the Tynemouth Aquarium, housing a colony of captive bred seals, sharks, giant octopus, otters and lots of amazing sea creatures. Well that's all the information for Tynemouth. I'll let you enjoy the aerial views of the town and I will see you all in a few moments.
Thank you.
Well, that's it for this particular episode. Next, we're crossing the river and we're going to continue our journey south, um, looking at the region of South Tyneside. If you've enjoyed this particular episode, please give it a like, subscribe if you haven't already done so, and don't forget to click on that bell icon so that you receive notifications of all the latest releases. I wish you all the very best of health and I will see you in the next episode very soon.